Well, good evening, everyone. Can um, can everyone hear me? Lovely. We've got a yes. <laughs> That's good news. Perfect. Welcome. So it's seven o'clock. I know a few of you are still just dropping in, so we'll not rush along too much. I see the waiting room is still filling up. But um, thank you to everyone for coming along. It's good to good to see such a good turnout. Lovely. So it seems like most people that are going to join us are here. So, so thank you all for coming along. Uh, welcome. Um, so this is uh, the first in hopefully a long series of, of webinars that uh, we're going to do for you here at um, STC Training Solutions. Um, so we are um, predominantly set up as a first aid training company um, last year, but uh, we are um, hoping to deliver training so across the, um, the spectrum, so from first aid all the way up to um, medical professionals and um, we've been talking for a little while about doing some ECG uh, webinars and and here we are so lockdown has made the perfect excuse to, to try it out so um, so a bit about me I'm Innes I'm a paramedic practitioner I work full-time uh, in a GP surgery uh, just outside London uh, and also do a bit of uh, bank work with a couple of the NHS trusts um, originally trained in London um, and worked there for a good few years uh, before escaping to the country so um, I've got a special interest in, in ECGs and anything to do with um, cardiology. So uh, hopefully I can and answer any questions as we go along this evening. So it's a fully interactive webinar. Um, we do have the chat up and running. I can see it. Um, Charlotte uh, is in there as STC admin who will be able to answer any questions that come through. And obviously if, if quite a few of you are asking the same question, then we will address it in the uh, uh, in the presentation as we go through. Um, there is an email address which we'll give you at the end uh, if you wanted to ask anything off air as well you can uh, email us directly. So um, hopefully tonight will last about an hour. I'm going to cover a few topics. Um, so just a few more of you arriving say so welcome. We haven't missed anything yet. Um, so I think it's just gone seven o'clock so should we, um, should we get going? Lovely. Just a couple more arriving. There we go. Fab. Right. So, um, so tonight, um, the uh, the basics of what we're going to go through. So, it's a nice introduction to ECGs. Um, this will be a series of, of sessions covering um, a, a whole range of topics. So, we'll be guided by what everybody wants, really. So, at the end, we'll ask for feedback on on what type of subjects we want to hear from you. So, tonight, we're going to look at some basic anatomy of the heart. Nothing, uh, nothing too in depth. Uh, we will delve into a little bit of electrophysiology and some of the biochem behind how um, the heart beats. Um, we'll look at how the ECG machines work, how they uh, they pick up on those uh, electrical impulses and, and turn them into something we can read. Um, just going back to basics, just talking about when we might want to uh, request an ECG for somebody. Lead placements and, and how we can tell which part of the heart we're looking at. Um, and uh, the layout of that printed ECG when it does come out of the machine, although uh, there are some variations we'll talk about. Um, and then we'll just kind of launch into uh, what each of the waves mean and then that will lead in nicely into uh, hopefully next week's session. So there'll be a Q&A session um, at the end. Um, so uh, at the time we'll, we'll, we'll take questions from the chat. So uh, the, the actual main lecture will last about an hour and then we'll, we'll have a Q&A session for as long as you guys want it to go in for afterwards. Um, there are a couple of uh, questions just thrown in. So um, hopefully most of you will have heard of or use Mentimeter at some point. Nice and easy, so just grab your smartphone close by if you can. Uh, when we get to the relevant page, we'll talk you through, but just go to menti.com and it should prompt you for a code. Um, and then just have that ready when we get to the right questions, put the code in and, and you can answer. So um, try and make it as interactive as possible. So we'll dive on in, shall we, if everybody's ready. Just a couple more just arrived, so you've not missed anything yet. That's what we're gonna cover tonight. So um, on we go. So. Couple of nice diagrams there, nothing too uh, difficult. Hopefully, a nice um, kind of refresher for people rather than anything new going on here. So, um, on the left there, we've got a nice diagram of uh, of the heart. Hopefully, no surprise. There's two atria, two ventricles. They're split left and right by a septum. Um, deoxygenated blood coming uh, back from the body systems drops into the right atrium via the uh, superior and inferior vena cava. 
um, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle and off into the pulmonary circuit where it's uh, reoxygenated, drops back into the left atrium through the mitral valve and out through the much more powerful left ventricle into systemic circulation. Um, as it heads out, it heads up over the aortic arch and obviously just behind the uh, mitral valve there, um, so that they're protected from the high pressures of, uh, of the aortic blood leaving the left ventricle, are the entrances to the left and right uh, coronary arteries. So we'll switch over to the diagram on the right there. Uh, talking about the left uh, now, so left coronary artery uh, quite clearly serves the left side of the heart predominantly, bifurcates quite early into the left circumflex which wraps around the, uh, the lateral wall and the left anterior descending, uh, which you may have heard of, uh, descends down to the inferior aspect with a diagonal branch um, just bearing off there. Uh, right coronary artery, a little bit more simple, heads straight round. Uh, it does bifurcate into the marginal and uh, right to posterior descending, but it's, it's commonly just thought of as, as a single vessel. We'll talk about those a little bit later, particularly when we, we, we will do a, a lecture on uh, acute coronary syndromes and things like that, where we'll look into um, coronary blood supply in a lot more detail and how we tell which vessel is, is blocked from, uh, from the ECG. Lovely. A little bit of electrophysiology, which is what ECGs are all about, really. The ECG machine is picking up on the electrical waves. So we're going to talk now uh, into a little bit of detail about how those electrical waves are generated. Um, hopefully this is all uh, relatively um, comfortable for people. This is something if, if you've done an ECG training in the, in the past should have been covered to some level. Um, in, in a nice healthy heart, the SA node is the boss really. So the SA node is producing um, electrical impulses that travel down groups of these specialist cardiac cells that are very, very good at talking to each other. They're very good at um, passing um, the signals down those, uh, those pathways. Um, and in doing so, they talk to the cells that are, that are very close to them um, and uh, get them to contract in effect. So they pass, the, in effect, the whole system is about passing signals in a coordinated manner um, throughout the heart. Uh, and the, the net effect is a heartbeat, which is obviously what we want. So the, um, the signals uh, originate from the sinoatrial node, as I say, in health. There's three internodal pathways that link the SA node to the AV node, uh, the posterior, middle, and uh, anterior branches. Um, there's also uh, Bachmann's bundle, which uh, wings its way over to the uh, the left atrium there. Obviously it wouldn't be much good if only the right atrium was contracting. We want the left atrium to do what the right one is doing at the same time, so Backman's bundle takes care of that. So an interesting point to note, certainly a take home point from this slide, is that um, there are, um, there's like a fibrous skeletal layer of the heart which separates the atria from the ventricles. So um, this fibrous layer is, is, is not conducive to electricity, so, so no signals can pass through that layer. Um, the only point uh, in the heart um, where the atria can, can communicate with the ventricles in electrical fashion is through the atria ventricular node, the AV node, which anatomically, as you can see there, is, is in the base of the, uh, the right atrium um, near the tricuspid valve. From there, it travels down the bundle of Hiss and bifurcates into um, the left and right bundle branches. The left bundle branch further bifurcates into the left anterior and left posterior fascicles, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail when we come on to heart blocks and, and things like that. So hopefully there's nothing too new there. Um, so just some other points to consider with um, when, we, when we look at problems with the heart later on. Um, so the SA node, we all know, should be the, the one that's in charge. If for whatever reason the SA node is knocked out or, or the signal between the SA node and the AV node is blocked, um, the AV node is capable of producing its own um, pacemaker signals, but they tend to be a lot slower and, and not so well innovated. So there's not so, um, so much um, kind of postural changes and things like that. And, and, and we can relate that back to sort of your your older folk that pop into our surgery and, and they've got a very slow heart rate, we, we pop the ECG leads on and find them in a heart block. Uh, you know, whenever they stand up, they feel very faint. That's just because the, the SA node is no longer communicating with the bottom of the heart. They're, they're getting a very slow rhythm that's, that's uh, originating from, from further down the system than it's supposed to. And there's no kind of input from, from the sympathetic or nervous, uh, parasympathetic nervous systems. So the SA node, if it was left to its own devices, would give you a heart rate of about 100 beats per minute. That's its kind of natural firing rate. And we'll look at, uh, at why that is in, in just a few minutes. But it's just worth noting that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves are the ones that come along and, and control that. So in most people, as we're sitting at the moment, our heart rate is probably a little bit less than 100. And that's because of something called vagal tone, which is uh, just some background current, if you like, from the uh, parasympathetic nerve fibers that 
um, that marry up to the SA node um, that just keep our, our heart rate at our normal kind of 60 to 70 for most of us. Lovely. Um, any questions on that before we kind of flick through into um, the cardiac action potentials and, and things along those lines? Just keep an eye on the chat. Feel free at any point, folks, just, just throw questions into the chat. I'm getting all good. That's good. Fabulous. Lovely. Okay, so we're going to talk about action potentials now. So it does have the potentials to get a little bit uh, complicated. So um, two types of cells predominantly in the heart, if we just go back to um, this, this screen for a minute. So um, two types of cells predominantly um, within the heart, the most prolific cardiac cells are the um, what's called the fast cells, the myocytes the cells that are actually going to contract and actually cause the, the heart to shrink in size and therefore push the blood um, out through the, um, through the, the, the great vessels. Um, so there's another type of cells which we refer to as slow cells or nodal cells, sometimes called pacemaker cells, and they live, as the name might suggest, within the nodes. So predominantly, um, the, the, most, the most prolific of these cells are within the SA node. But again, as we've already mentioned, there are a group of these cells in the AV node ready to take over if things go wrong. And of course, further down the system, um, there are also some some further um, some further pacemaker cells, uh, which again we'll talk about uh, in a bit more detail later. So the two types, we're going to start with the um, the fast cells, the the worker cells, the the, the uh, cardiac myocytes that are actually going to cause contraction of the heart, and they do that um, through calcium. So they have to have a process for getting calcium into into the heart. Again. You don't need to know this information to be able to read an ECG. It's just very nice to have in, in, your, in your mind some kind of awareness that um, sodium, potassium and calcium um, have a huge effect on, um, on how ECGs uh, present and how patients present um, with certain types of arrhythmias and things like that. So we'll, we'll have a little look. This is the cardiac action potential. It looks a bit daunting when you first look at it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you've never seen it before, but we'll, we'll try and just kind of briefly go through that. If anyone knows about this, then hopefully this will just serve as, uh, as a bit of a refresher. But so if I can just get my little annotations, I'll have to bear with me. My, my artistic skills are, are, are nowhere near the best. So I didn't inherit that gene. So all cells in the body predominantly. Let's, uh, let's just draw a little cell wall. So we have a, a cell membrane. Yeah, obviously this is a, this is a big cell, this is a, a circle in four, but we're just going to deal with this kind of side of the cell wall. So within the cellular compartments, um, we always have a relatively high concentration of, of potassium. Okay. Um, and outside of the cell, we always have a relatively high concentration of sodium. Okay. Now that comes about because of things called sodium potassium pumps. I'm sure you can do plenty of reading on those. Drop in the comments, folks, if you want a, a, you know, a proper lecture on, on cellular biology when, with things like this, we can certainly arrange something. I won't go into too much detail tonight. But the, the purpose of the sodium potassium pumps are to, are to keep this concentration gradient because it's actually really good for the cell um, to be able to, um, that's quite an annoying feature of Zoom. When somebody joins the meeting, it covers up my scratch pad so I can't actually draw. So. If I pause for a minute, that's why. So, um, so the sodium potassium pumps keep this in balance. So we want more sodium in the cell than outside the cell. We want more potassium outside the cell inside uh, than, than inside of the cell to keep these, these gradients there. Obviously, if we if we just allowed this sodium potassium pump to, to carry on as it as it will, you know, eventually this, this cell is just going to explode with 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 um, potassium and, and we're going to run out of sodium. So this, this whole system is just going to grind to a halt. So there have to be some leakage channels. So in effect, just, just to have in the back of your mind, there is all the time some, some potassium leaking out of the cell. And there is, to a much lesser extent, some sodium leaking into the cell at any one point. Okay. So that just allows this process to keep going. So there's about 40 times more potassium passing through the cell membranes than there is sodium. So just worth bearing in mind when we get into this electrical graph over here. But, so this is a cell, this is a cell in equilibrium. This is a cell that's quite happy. And, and if nobody comes along and does anything to this cell, it's not gonna change. It's gonna maintain uh, approximately 40 times more sodium inside the cell than outside the cell. It's gonna, and it's gonna maintain a high extracellular concentration of sodium. Sorry, potassium in the cell. Um, Excellent. So, but what a cardiac cell needs is, is for um, calcium to enter the cell. The calcium causes the, the, the cell to contract and to cause the heartbeat. So this is where this graph comes in. We talk about 
um, ions moving in and out of cells are what give them their, their electrical potential. So the cell voltage is all derived from, from where these ions are moving and how the ions are moving, the concentrations of them, et cetera, et cetera. As I say, if, if, if folks are interested in this, then we can do a separate lecture in, in more detail. This is just kind of a whistle-stop tour. What happens with, with cardiac myocytes is that they're affected by the, the cells that, um, that make up the um, Hispakinji system, where, where from, from the SA node to the AB node and down to the Kinji fibers, the, the, the cells that make up that um, system secrete sodium and calcium in quite high concentrations as they go past. And as I said on the last slide, as that signal shoots down that messaging system, the cells that are neighboring it are, are um, activated as it were, and they're activated by sodium and by um, calcium. So calcium kind of sits out in this extracellular compartment when one of these uh, electrical impulses shoots down the Hispakinji system, which is nice and close to this cell. So this cell is about to get activated. What happens, and what we, what we talk about with, with um, electrical potential, without I'm trying not to make it too confusing, is that the, um, every, every ion, if it left to its own devices, would bring the resting cell membrane to a certain figure. So in the case of potassium, potassium is going to have a negative effect on, on cell membrane. If potassium is left to its own devices, the cell would settle at about minus 92 millivolts. Okay. If, if sodium was left to its own devices, it would drag the, the cell volume up, the, uh, sorry, the cell um, resting membrane to tension up to about 67 millivolts, positive 67. And if calcium was allowed to do its own thing, it would take it even higher. It would take it up to 123 millivolts right up there. Okay. Obviously, it would never get to those because cells are never exclusively permeable to only one ion at the same time. So... Energy, go, the, uh, the signal goes down through the Hispakinji system. It deposits a load of sodium and calcium into the um, extracellular compartment in the process, and that starts to leak into the cell. So let me just draw you a new cell. So this is a cell at the moment that's quite happy, but it's being surrounded by lots of sodium and calcium. Oh, just wait for that box to go, and then I can carry on. <laughs> oh, no. Bear with us, folks. This Zoom isn't the most user-friendly of systems we're finding out. So. Okay, there we go. So, so sodium and calcium are, are going to enter this cell. Okay. Now, if, if potassium was the only thing running in and out of the cell, this cell would have a resting voltage of minus 92. The fact that there is some sodium getting into the cell, the sodium would want to drag it up to plus 67. And... Um, and actually, what, what we end up with then is a resting cell voltage of approximately minus 80. Okay, lovely. So this cell starts life at approximately minus 80 millivolts. As this sodium and calcium enters the cell, what do we think is going to happen to this voltage? Bearing in mind that sodium wants to drag it up to positive 67, calcium wants to drag it up to a positive 1, 2, 3. What do we think is going to happen to this cell's um, action potential. Anyone want to fire into the comments? Equalize, equalize. So you're thinking the right. Yes, it's going to move to positive. Fantastic. So um, you're both on the right lines. Absolutely. So so the resting uh, the resting cell wants to sit at about eighty. That's because it's predominantly um, permeable to to um, potassium because there is some sodium leaking in. Um, it will be. Um, Sorry, just in the comments there, just making sure everything's all right with technical stuff. Um, so because there's some sodium coming in, it wants to drag it up very slightly, but it's only very slightly permeable sodium. If you suddenly start dumping a load of sodium and a load of calcium in, you're absolutely right. The voltage is going to increase. And this is what happens here. And eventually it passes what's called the threshold voltage for um, depolarization threshold uh, at around minus 60 millivolts. And as it passes through that, we get fast sodium channels opening within the um, cell membrane. So not only do we have sodium being dumped in here from the neighboring cells that have been depolarized, we've now got fast sodium cells, uh, channels, sorry, dumping loads of sodium ions into this cell. So we're gonna continue this upward climb towards 67. If the cell was now left to its own devices, it would try and head to about positive 67. It won't ever get there because there's still lots of potassium hanging around, dragging it back down again. But that's, that's the kind of direction it's now going in. It'll eventually get to about kind of plus 15, plus 20. 
um, and um, and eventually these um, sodium channels will just close off because we only need the cell to depolarize a certain amount. So we get to uh, around this level, around plus 15, those sodium channels close. Um, and at around the same time, some very slow kind of calcium channels start to open. But if you imagine now this cell is pretty much back where it started. So you've, you've taken on some sodium and calcium enough to get it past the threshold voltage. The voltage gated channels have opened, loads of sodium is dumped into the cell um, and it's depolarized. So it's got to the top of its depolarization arc here um, and those sodium channels are closed. So we see a slight decline. So the slight decline is, is caused because basically the cell has come back to its equilibrium state or trying to. So it's come back to this state where basically it's just seeping um, potassium because potassium is now the dominant ion. It's going to start to head back down towards 92, uh, negative 92. Um, as I say, in, in that process, you do get some slow opening of some calcium channels. So I'll just draw those in there for you um, once. Let's just get rid of that. And say so the calcium channels open up and you start to get kind of a slow dribble in of some calcium. So if you imagine you've got potassium leaving and actually in that process, more, more potassium channels open. You start to lose lots and lots of potassium from your cell. You start to get some, some um, calcium coming in and actually you get what's called this plateau. So this leveling off because the, the two are, are acting in, in, uh, in opposites. So the calcium is, is bringing it up to 123. The, the potassium is trying to bring it back down to uh, minus 92 and you get this plateau. Eventually though, these um, calcium channels, they also close off. And this is why you then get that steady decline because now the cell is just secreting lots and lots of um, potassium and it will eventually reach its, its kind of equilibrious level. Back down here, it's at minus 80. Um, everything, everything extra will close off. So those extra potassium channels will close and, and you will eventually just get back to a cell in its resting state. So I realize that's a kind of whistle stop tour and, and it is very, very hard to get this subject into, into a few minutes and not talk for the whole hour on it. Um, but I hope I haven't just completely confused everyone with my terrible art and <laughs> and all the other bits and pieces with this. The, the technology isn't the brilliant, um, the most brilliant for this. So, fab. So we'll head on to the next slide. So we're just going to talk about, so these are the cardiac myocytes. These are the ones that are actually contracting and pushing blood around the body. Um, the next cells we're going to talk about are the are the the automatic ones, the pacemaker cells that are going to beat without any input. So if you notice with these, they need sodium and 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 calcium to be dumped at their door before they contract. Um, with the pacemaker cells, let me just get rid of that and go to the next slide. If it will let me, hang on. There we go. So we go to the, um, the slower cells. So slow cell action potential is effectively the pacemaker cell. So the main differences um, between the two are that um, slow cells are at rest. It, you know, effectively, there are the same things going on. There's, there's a higher concentration of potassium in the cell. So you get some, cell, um, some potassium leaking out of the cells, a higher concentration of sodium outside. So you get some sodium leaking in and you have sodium potassium pumps which are doing exactly what they were doing in, in the other cell okay but the only difference with these ones is that they are more permeable to potassium so you find that there's actually a lot more uh, sorry sodium there's a lot more um, there's a lot more sodium um, leaking into the cell along the concentration gradient and that makes the cell a little bit more uh, unstable. So your resting threshold is, is a little bit lower because there's more sodium coming in there. Don't forget sodium was right up here trying to pull the uh, trying to pull the resting voltage up to 67 millivolts. So the fact that there's more sodium coming in it causes this kind of instability. So you find that the resting membrane potential degrades over time. It reaches this um, this threshold that we had the same as last time. And all that happens with these, these cells are a lot more simple, is that calcium channels open. Calcium channels open at that um, threshold. Uh, and as they reach about positive 10, those calcium channels close. And at the same time, the same time as the calcium channels close, we get more potassium channels open. So whistle stop tour. 
fabulous. Okay. So control of heart rate, um, the way the way that sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve fibers are going to control this heart rate is is by the um, neurotransmitters that they secrete. So with the um, sympathetic nervous system, obviously the fight or flight response, um, secreting noradrenaline. Noradrenaline interacts with the beta one uh, receptors um, to make the cell more permeable to um, sodium and um, and to calcium as well. So, if you can imagine, if uh, if you make a cell more more uh, more permeable to sodium and calcium, you're going to have a steeper climb, and and we're going to reach this threshold potential faster. We're going to depolarize, and then the whole process is going to repeat in a in a faster method. Okay. Um, likewise, the parasympathetic nervous system is going to secrete uh, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is going to react with the uh, M2 receptors. The M2 receptors are going to make the cell less permeable to um, sodium and to calcium and actually more permeable to potassium. So again, we're gonna make this, this initial upslope lower and that's gonna give a relative bradycardia. Okay, again, whistle stop saw, hope that makes sense. And we can certainly go into more detail on that um, as we go through. So I think the first, uh, first quiz question is coming up. Let me just um, get rid of all of this, otherwise. Uh, do, do, do that one and we're just going to pop the quiz question up so grab your smartphones menti.com and the code uh, we're going to use is up on the screen there 693739 um, there's a question there for you so for those of you that are familiar with amiodarone which phase of the action potential is amiodarone having an effect on uh, i'll give you a few minutes to, to vote pop your votes in once uh, a good majority of you have voted we'll there we go. So phase zero, one, two, three, or four. Which phase are we uh, are we affecting there? So amiodarone. For those that haven't come across it, amiodarone is a drug we use in um, cardiac arrest um, in uh, ventricular arrhythmias predominantly. And we'll go back to why. month's worth of uh, biochem into 10 minutes. Well, hopefully it's made some sense in that 10 minutes. <laughs> Fabulous, so we're getting there. We'll just wait till we get to 30. Get your votes in, ladies and gents. Good, I'm glad we can help. Uh, okay, so most of you going for phase two, okay. Um, so, well done, so we're getting a few more votes in. So correct answer is phase three. We will uh, we will go back to that date. We are going to talk about things like this in, in a lot more detail than it was a, it was a curveball. Hang on, I can't uh, get it to change screens, bear with me. <laughs> So we're going to go back to, right. Okay, amiodarone, amiodarone works on fast cells. Um, it's, an, it's a drug given in cardiac arrest in VF and VT. Um, what it does, it, do you remember when we were talking about the, um, the third stage um, of this action potential, um, where predominantly what's going on with the cells is that uh, loads of potassium um, those potassium channels are open, um, potassium is pouring out the cell and of course um, the equilibrium voltage that, that the cell wants to get to in that state is about minus 92 so we've got this massive downward trend. What amiodarone does is it blocks those um, potassium channels so it slows the leakage of potassium out of the cell and it, and it just gives a bit of a flatter trajectory to this phase three um, of the action potential. Um, now I, I believe the, the, the evidence is, is slightly limited on whether it actually makes much effect in cardiac arrest, but it's one of those things that we use. Um, the, the hypothesis, I suppose, behind it is that it gives the, um, in VF particularly, the, the ventricles are, are going a bit haywire. If you slow down phase three, it just gives them a chance to um, catch their breath almost and, and uh, get an organised rhythm back to them. So, so that's uh, amiodarone and um, phase three of the action potential. So. Well done for those 30% uh, that, that got that right. Um, we will talk about that in more, so lovely. Okay, um, 
so we've kind of gone through the biomed side of things and, and in that we've learned that um, these cells are, are throwing off um, electrical impulses. Now those electrical impulses all have um, a bit of a random direction to them. Um, and this was a subject that, that confused me when I first heard about it. So I hope I can put it over to you in, in good terms. So those individual myocytes that are kicking off uh, electrical um, activity are, are throwing off what's called vectors. Now those vectors are obviously, um, there's, there's millions of them within the heart as, as, the, as the heart's beating and they're represented by these little black arrows. Now, predominantly speaking, um, in, a, in a healthy heart, the direction of electrical impulses comes from the SA node to the AV node, down the His bundle, down the bandle branch blocks and into the Purkinje um, fibres. So you would expect, as you see in this diagram, to have a general trend of all those electrical activity to be in that general kind of, if you were looking at that as a map, that kind of southeasterly direction. So what, what we do with vectors, vectors is the individual myocytes firing. We, if we add all those directions together, as it were, and then find an average, um, there's, that's what we call the axis. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about axis because that is a whole section, pretty much. There's a whole, there's a whole lecture coming up on, on axis deviations. Um, so, so cardiac axis, I think it's just to be aware that that's the sum of all the vectors of all the individual myocytes. And it gives you an idea of the general trend of direction of the electrical activity going through the heart okay um, and how that then kind of translates into an ECG is you imagine that your individual ECG leads are cameras so they're cameras stuck on the skin facing in at the heart and they're looking at this electrical activity they're looking at it as, a, as an access as a general um, uh, mean as it were um, and if that axis is pointed directly at the camera, it's going to see a positive wave. Okay, and, and I think the next slide um, explains that quite well. So if you look to the right initially, um, so the furthest most right uh, camera, you've got a, an axis that's heading straight for the lens. So any lead on an ECG that has just a, a positive deflection, so there's no, there's no negative S wave at all. Uh, we'll cover the leads uh, later, but the, no negative S wave, um, as, as you see in this uh, last camera. Um, that is an axis that's heading straight towards that lead. Okay. Um, if it was uh, heading away, you'd get a negative deflection. If it was heading perpendicular, you'd get a biphasic lead, as you see in the middle there. So I think that this, this kind of picture summed it up a little bit for me. Um, but again, we, we are going to go into axis in a lot more detail. So. Um, Again, tonight was just supposed to be a whistle stop just so you're aware of access and um, we'll talk about it later. So um, moving on, I'm sure I'm preaching um, to the converted here of, of when we're actually going to do ECGs. I'm sure most of you are, are doing some clinical practice of some sort or, or training along those lines. Um, the fairly obvious indications for an ECG are going to be unexplained chest pain dyspnea. I think that's fairly, um, fairly easy to explain why. Unstable patients, where the, where the cause is, is not immediately known. I think if you, if you particularly if you go to somebody that's, that's um, um, you know, very, very much unstable. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? With uh, low blood pressure, high, high heart rate, et cetera, you're, you're going to be looking at um, doing ECGs to, to try and see if there's a cardiac cause behind it. Hemodynamically unstable is the word, of course, I'm looking for. So, um, any kind of transient loss of consciousness, first presentation, seizure, it's always a good idea just to make sure there's no underlying um, cardiac cause of that. We're, we're, we're certainly going to go through plenty of those as the lectures go on. Um, plenty of different weird and wonderful arrhythmias. Uh, unexplained falls in the elderly for very much the same reason. You know, there's um, lots of lots of these patients have undiagnosed heart defects, and actually, the the first presentation to to us is commonly when they've had a fall or or when they've had uh, some palpitations or some um, uh, some syncope episodes, etc. Abnormal pulses. I think you're going to take that into context of the patient that's sitting in front of you very much. So I think um, the guidelines, these these guidelines, I've I've pretty much paraphrased from um, some trust guidelines for for uh, when the ambulance services used to work for. Um, they, they advised an ECG on anyone with a pulse of less than 40 and over 150, which I agree with. But then again, if, if I've got a 90 year old gentleman sitting in front of me in the surgery uh, with a pulse of 48, I, I don't think I would turn him away without an ECG. Likewise, you know, an otherwise fit and healthy 25 year old sitting in front of me with a resting heart rate of 140. I'm probably going to want to know what's going on there. So it's, it's taken with context. Newly irregular is, is obviously looking at um, atrial fibrillation and things along those lines, which we'll talk about in detail. Drug overdoses and recreational drug use. Um, there are many drugs out there that, that can affect um, 
the uh, the cardiac cycle. So uh, so we always look at ECGs um, when you think there might be some some secondary cardiac involvement. Um, and uh, the trust I used to work for had uh, um, had quite a lot of information around um, diabetics with unexplained symptoms. I think um, with with particularly poorly controlled diabetes, um, pain pathways can be altered and, and actually in a, acute coronary syndromes, they can present with quite um, uh, um, kind of non-specific symptoms, I suppose is the best word you can, you can but if, there is, if you can't explain why diabetics are well, it's, it's always worth doing an ECG. And I think the real big take home message, and I don't think this has ever hammered home enough really, is that actually a normal ECG does not rule out acute coronary syndrome. I've seen people caught out with this. Um, you know, you, just because you've done a snapshot ECG at that moment in time um, doesn't mean that patient's not having an MI. Obviously, you've got to take clinical presentation in, into into account when you're when you're making that decision. But um, I read uh, somewhere today a uh, New England Journal of Medicine quotes figures of 16 to 20 percent of cases of, of ACS, um, as in non-STEMI and, and and unstable angina that present with a normal ECG um, on initial presentation. So, so don't get caught out with that. So we're we're just going to talk uh, briefly about further investigations and the on, the only way of really being certain that your patient is not having an ECG is, is by is by giving them a good cardiac workup. So serial ECGs, an ECG is a snapshot in time. They, they change, um, particularly in developing MIs. Um, serial bloods, um, so this little graph just, just highlights. So the three main kind of bloods requested in, in, a, in an acute coronary patient are gonna be your myoglobin, CKMB and troponin. I'm sure everybody's heard about troponin because it is the most specific thing. So. Um, but as you see from the graph there, it's not actually at its highest until about 24 hours after infarct. Um, so there may be other tests that you need to do in the meantime. Imaging for undifferentiated chest pain is, is generally going to involve chest x-ray, possibly CT, MRI or, um, or echo. And of course, gold standard is, is angiography. And, and at the end of the day, we're certainly talking from an ambulance service background, the number of times patients will go in for angio just because, you know, we can't, we can't say for sure that they're not having an acute cardiac event. It's, um, it's absolutely something that you can do and can consider for these patients. So, fabulous. Again, lead placement, I would hope this isn't new. Um, so ride your, own, ride your green bike is, uh, is the way we were all told, but uh, I think that's kind of going out the window a little bit. I, uh, I found this slide today and actually a lot of the newer ECG machines haven't got red, yellow, green and black electrodes anymore. They're white, black. Um, red and green, which is really helpful if you try and put those on ride your green bike, you'll get some very weird readings. So just make sure you're um, you're having a look at what's actually stamped on the lead. So right arm clearly goes on the right arm, left arm. I'm not going to insult you with going on with those. So chest leads, um, I've, I've seen some fantastic um, versions of where V1 and V2 are supposed to go. So um, generally always too high. So um, the way we were taught angle of Louis, um, it's the most prominent. Um, notch just below your your jugular um and um that goes uh, so that the, the the rib space kind of immediately perpendicular to those is your second intercostal space countdown to v1 and v2 um go there either side of the sternal border uh, and as you can see generally placing v4 next in the midclavicular line of the fifth intercostal space and then v6 around um in the um the medial aspect um, but just bearing in mind that the rib kind of curves up and this diagram shows that quite well that actually v6 does sit higher than v4 but it is still within the same rib space so just some uh, refresher points there so um often questions come up about whether to put limb leads on the torso or on the wrists and ankles um i've, I've kind of looked into this before and, and there doesn't appear to be a huge amount of difference in in findings there, there was one um paper that that found um potentially uh, limb leads placed on the torso um had a lower um a lower ac accuracy uh in determining sc elevation and things along those lines but then other papers have found since then that that's not the case and actually the the benefits of having less artifacts uh, i'm sure you're all aware of you put um limb leads on on the, the the distal ends of limbs in a patient that's shivering or moving or, or in any way any other way agitated you're not going to get a very good reading so actually the benefits of having that um that clearer reading from torsos um can actually outweigh those uh, um those negatives so hopefully nothing new there so views of the heart so 
we were talking about kind of the axis and, and how um, the leads are effectively a camera looking in at the heart. So I think we use that same principle here. So um, leads one, two, AVF, three and AVR are, are all sitting up there. So um, again, if you imagine the camera sitting on the on the blue arrowheads looking back at the heart, that's the view of the heart you're getting. Lead two, there's no re the reason why we use lead two for most of our rhythm strips and most of our, our kind of rhythm um, diagnosis is because actually it follows fairly closely the um, the natural axis of a healthy heart uh, as I said before going from the SA node to the AV node and back down to the Purkinje fibers um, you generally you generally find that the electrical activity is moving towards lead two and it gets a good view it gets a good view of the atria so you see nice clear P waves and um, you see all the leads nice and clearly um, and it makes sense to kind of do most of your diagnoses from that lead um, chest leads, I put a couple of diagrams there because it's not always clear, but the, the chest leads are, are effectively looking um, on a horizontal plane towards the heart. So they're looking at different parts of the heart. The so um, if you look to, to the right and lowest of the screen there, you can see V1 to V6 um, placed as though it's on the, on the rib cage. Um, V1 and V2 looking very much at the septal uh, wall of the heart, V3, V4. Um, looking at the left ventricle and V5 and V6 looking quite clearly at the, um, the lateral wall. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. It's just nice sometimes to put it into a, a picture. Um, and just a quick note there about augmented views for those that haven't come across them before. Augmented views are, are basically just the computer generates those views. They don't actually come from a positive and negative lead as the others do. Um, so chest leads and limb leads and the views that they give you um, there for you. Hopefully again, nothing, nothing too new. So lovely. Um, and actually, uh, brilliant. So when the ECG starts to print out, that's our next section. So um, again, hopefully nothing new here, just a nice little um, refresher. So uh, inferior leads are going to be 2, 3 and AVF. Um, what is commonly just grouped together is the anterior leads also includes the septals. You remember on the last slide we said there V1 and V2 are technically looking at the septal wall, V3 and V4 are looking at the left ventricle. But they, as I said, they're commonly grouped together into anterior leads. Um, and your lateral leads are, are basically the, the odd ones out. The one way um, I've kind of been taught it before is that the, um, actually no, it doesn't make sense. So, don't worry. <laughs> so the lateral leads are, are, these, are these ones shaded in green. AVR is a bit of a strange lead. Um, it's generally used um, just to check that the limb leads are on correctly, but there is, again, there's some evidence coming around uh, ST elevation and AVR. So we're gonna talk about that uh, at a later date. So um, this is just something useful to have um, and to, to remind yourself with if it's not something you're familiar with. So you know when you see some groups of leads together with abnormalities, you can start to make a guess at where in the heart um, we are having um, we are having problems. Uh, I've just seen a question going out. I think Charlotte's responding to it, but yes, um, I'll let her respond. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you, you can have a copy of this. This will all be uploaded to our website um, at some stage over the next few days, and, and we'll do some um, we'll do some handouts to go with it uh, over the next few days. Okay. So um, ECGs again. So this is a kind of typical layout. Um, I said at the beginning there are some there are some different layouts. I know the ECG machine we use in our surgery at the moment does a does a very strange layout. It has um, it has six leads down the left, six leads down the right, so much longer chunks of rhythm strip, and then you have different rhythm strips at the bottom. But this is your your typical standard layout. But it is just a kind of a caution to say make sure you know the equipment you're you're working with because sometimes you, you print out an ECG and it looks completely different to this. But this is kind of national standard, I would say. Uh, in the ambulance service, for those of you that are in there, the, um, the paper's generally a bit thinner, so you don't, you don't get the rhythm strip at the bottom. It normally comes out afterwards or printed separately. So. Print speed is typically 25 millimeters a second. Um, that gives your, that's your standard. Most machines will default to that. Um, you can change the speed. I don't really see any point in speeding it up. If you imagine, uh, sorry, in, in slowing it down, as you'd imagine, if you slow it down, you're going to speed up uh, or narrow uh, everything together. So you're going to give yourself less detail. But uh, certainly, you have had occasions where I've slowed the paper down to 50 millimeters a second, um, and the uh, and of course you get it. Of course, I'm getting it all the way the wrong way around. I'm say 50 millimeters a second is of course speeding up the paper and dragging out the um, the QRS complex. You can make out some more detail there. It's particularly useful in in some tachycardias where you're trying to um, ascertain what exactly is going on. Sometimes printing at 50 millimeters per second can give you that extra detail. 
Um, just some basics to remember because we all forget them from time to time. Small square is 40 milliseconds when we're talking about uh, left to right um, and one millivolt when we're talking up and down. Uh, a large square is, is five small squares, so 200 milliseconds. Um, to estimate a, um, uh, the heart rate, um, so this is the way I was taught, I mean, I, I'm, my, my mental math is awful, so I, I can never do this without a calculator, but if, if you were ever in a situation where you have an ECG printed off and the machine hasn't told you the rate, get a new machine, um, or if you really are stuck, then um, 300 divided by the number of large squares between the R waves, that only really works for a, a, um, a regular rhythm. Um, although with an irregular rhythm, you can, you can kind of get an average together, I think. Um, so yeah, 300 divided by the large squares, um, will give you an approximate pulse, uh, which is quite a useful little thing to remember. Um, in a tachycardia where you, you know, there's not a large square, I mean, that's a very fast tachycardia that you can use. Um, 1500 divided by the number of small squares works exactly the same way, obviously five times bigger. Um, so hopefully that's a nice little helper there. Um, so kind of coming into the end really of today. So, um, so we're gonna talk now about uh, ECG waves and what they represent. Um, formula for QTC I've just seen pop up. Fantastic. So um, I will um, I will get that for you. It's not actually part of this presentation, um, but it would fit in quite nicely around now, wouldn't it? So uh, maybe Charlotte can look up the um, formula for um, QTC and pop that into the comments. Um, fabulous. So um, we're going to look at ECG waves. So um, we've got our ECG. We've printed it out. We know um, from this chart where um, where each of the ECG leads are, are looking. And you can see in each of the leads, they, they have a, a fairly distinct pattern to them. So that, that pattern is obviously the QRS, PQRS and T waves. So P wave, um, the P wave is, is so we, we're gonna be talking about lead two next week. So I'm just gonna stick to lead two uh, for the time being. The P wave is generally a, a positive deflection and that's because the atria are contracting towards the uh, the positive electrode of lead two. So you're going to see a positive deflection. Q waves in a healthy heart you don't want to see, but a Q wave is, is a negative deflection um, before the, ventri the ventricle contracts, which your QRS complex is a ventricle contraction. Okay. Um, the J that you see in there re re uh, relates to the J points, uh, which is another term for kind of the, um, where, where the ST segment starts. You quite often hear when, when people talk about um, ST elevation MIs, uh, they talk about the J points, that is the J point, it's where the S wave becomes the T wave. Um, so when we talk of, uh, when, when, we're, when we're talking amongst ourselves and we're trying to figure out whether this, this patient in front of us is having an MI, we're often scratching our heads and saying, yeah, but the J point there is fine and the J point there is not. And that's what we do, isn't it? And then eventually we go, do you know what, let's just go to the cath lab and let them work it out. So, um, RR interval, we'll start from the top, RR interval is, is what we just talked about there. So that's what we're going to use to um, calculate the, um, the pulse rate if you needed to. But we're also going to have a look at the RR interval to see whether it's regular in, in determining whether our rhythm is regular. Um, P waves, as I said, is um, atrial contraction. The PR interval, um, which is what um, is highlighted in blue there on the left hand side, the start of the P wave to the end of the, uh, sorry, to the beginning of the uh, R wave is the delay um, at the AV node. Remember we talked earlier about that delay being important. Um, maybe we didn't talk in enough detail, but that was the, the, the PR interval. The delay at the AV node is to allow the atria to contract fully and to, to fill the ventricles. Um, and thus giving you know better preload for the ventricles, better cardiac output. If that, if that PR interval is too short, um, you find that the ventricles um, only partly fill and, and you lose some cardiac output as a result. So you want the PR interval to be about right. Uh, QRS complex gets wide in blocks. Um, typically you want it about three small squares, 120 milliseconds. Um, as I say, we talked about J points and um, ST elevation very briefly. We are going to talk a, a whole lot more about that as the lectures go on. T waves again, T waves are going to have their own lecture because they're, they're um, great creatures that can tell us lots of things about what the heart's going on. I think they're, they're pretty poorly taught generally. So let's, um, let's really hammer down T waves in a separate section. Um, there is a U wave on this. Uh, this is why I picked it because uh, the, the U wave that nobody really understands uh, does occasionally uh, appear in some ECGs, particularly um, patients that have potassium imbalances. Um, so we will talk, uh, we'll talk about electrolyte disturbances as a separate thing. Um, 
and uh, that's where we are. And then the QT interval. So Charlotte's very kindly put up some different formulas for calculating uh, the QT. So it's it's not an easy sum to do, as you can see. Uh, and the machines do it for you. Um, there is uh, a QTC scale, um, a very good one uh, floating around if you Google it, um, that, that can give you um, some uh, indication of what's normal in it's slightly different in males and females um, and again we'll talk about the importance of, of QT intervals uh, at a later date um, and uh, fabulous so so the QT interval basically if, if, a, if a heart rate 60 you can take the QT um, interval that's that you actually see on the page as as the QTC so it's just correcting it for rate in, in effect lovely um, so I mean that's kind of uh, where we are. We've done quite well for time, actually. I thought it was going to take a bit longer to go through some of that. So obviously there was a bit of a whistle stop tour of some of those subjects. So um, we are about to have a Q and A. But if anyone wants to jump in with any questions um, that uh, we could we could cover now while you're all with us, um, then then feel free. Obviously, if people have other things to do then um, and want to start disappearing, then um, our next lecture is going to be at the same time next week. So 7 o'clock, British summer time next Monday, the 18th of May. We're going to cover lead two rhythms. Um, so we'll start looking at the waves in a lot more detail, what they actually mean and, and when they're and when they're going wrong, what we need to do about them. Uh, we'll send the Zoom link out via Facebook, same as we've done today. Um, so keep, a, keep an eye on our Facebook. If you haven't liked us already, like us and you'll get the updates. Um, if you want a CPD certificate, bear with us on this one. We, we are putting a process in place, but drop us an email at webinars at stctrainingsolutions.co.uk. Um, and it's now the, uh, the Q&A session. If you've enjoyed tonight, we would be really grateful of, obviously we're, we're doing this um, you know, free of charge. So uh, if, if you are kind enough to leave us some reviews, if you've enjoyed tonight, it goes a long way in helping customers find us and use us for, for some of the paid services that we offer. But um, it really is now a q and It's over to you guys. So if there's anything that hasn't made any sense, if there's, um, if there's anything that, that we haven't covered properly, then we will um, then we can answer it now for you. So the floor is yours. So I've got one come in. Uh, so I didn't mention actually before um, too many of you leave. These will these are being recorded. This uh, lecture is being recorded. It will go up on YouTube. Um, we will share that through our Facebook page as well. So you can always watch this at a later date. Um, and I'm going to tidy up some of the drawings I did and put them as a as an extra handout. So. Uh, lovely, right, so I've just had a question come in. What's the most common reasons for electrolyte imbalance? Uh, is there a group of conditions that can impact the potassium, calcium and sodium levels? Feel free to ignore if this will be covered in a different uh, webinar from uh, Natasha. Um, so yes, in effect, it is, it is going to be covered in a separate webinar. We, we are going to talk, so we, we've, we've been doing a bit of planning um, and actually we're going to do a, a section on bloods immediately following the ECG series because I think the two go quite nicely hand in hand. Um, so, uh, absolutely, we are, we are going to cover that. So, yes, so we'll, we'll pop that on hold. <laughs> Definitely potassium, we're going to talk about quite a lot when we come to T waves and um, other bits and pieces, calcium. Uh, calcium, we don't cover too much, but um, calcium disturbances are quite common in cancers. Uh, fab. Any other questions, folks? Top tips for learning ECGs. Fabulous. OK. Um, watch something like this, I would suggest. I mean, th this is how I learned I learned ECGs was from YouTube channels and, and Life in the Fast Lane is a really good uh, online uh, resource. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will have probably seen that. Um, top tips to start basic, don't go in there and try and learn MIs off the start, you need to learn what's going on underneath. So we're going to start uh, exactly how I um, how I learned, which was to really dissect lead 2 first of all, because you can you can diagnose a lot just from lead 2, you don't need the full 12 lead in a lot of cases, with, depending on what you're looking for of course. So start with the basics, Start learn how the ECG picks up the signals, learn, um, learn your lead 2 rhythms and then um, and then look at all the weird and wonderful stuff that goes on uh, over and above that. That would be my advice. And we're, we're going to help you with that.
Shut up. Give you a few minutes just in case there's any uh, any other questions. Oh, we've lost our. Uh, here we go. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you, uh, Natasha. It's always a worry when you run through biochem so quickly that it doesn't make sense. So hopefully it has. No problem, you're welcome. Fantastic, Matt, that's good to hear. So we, we look forward to seeing uh, seeing you guys over the next few weeks as we go into more different subjects. Hmm? Oh, why does it keep doing that? Yes, um, we, we can talk about AVR now. It is going to come up in a future lecture as well. Um, so AVR isn't generally used too much. Um, AVR is when, when certainly when we were when we were taught um, ECGs, AVR was was predominantly a lead that should always be negative. And if, if you've got a, a whole load of positive leads in AVR, um, you've probably put one of the limb leads on in the wrong place. And, and that was pretty much the only training we had in it. Uh, if I'm just going to flick through to, oh no, I've just gone past it, I think. Um, so if you look at what AVR is looking at, AVR is, is effectively the reverse of lead two. So um, it goes, it, it makes sense that um, AVR should be predominantly negative if you look at that. All the, you know, depolarization of the cells is moving away from, from that camera lens, as it were. So. Um, and V7, 8, V9, we're going to talk about, so alternative views, that's uh, for looking for posterior MI. So we're going to talk that in uh, about that in the acutely unwell patients a little bit later on when we would do V7, 8 and 9. Good question. Um, so yeah, so AVR predominantly just used to gross error check the input, the limb leads on in the wrong place. Um, there is some growing evidence that um, if you see ST elevation in, in an AVR, it could be uh, an indicator of uh, trivessel disease, so particularly unwell patient, particularly unstable cardiac patient. Um, I've yet to see it in any kind of um, useful way, if that makes sense. So um, I think it's probably quite a rare finding. I think these patients are normally critically unwell and, and probably more likely in VF than any rhythm that you could interpret. No problem. No problem, you're welcome. We uh, we will do our best. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Good to hear. Uh, not next week, um, Ash. No, uh, MIs. I think I'm um, just kind of thinking through. We've we've got a draft plan of of what's going to be happening in the next few weeks, but um, we're probably looking about three or four lectures ahead for for MIs. It will be one of the earlier ones because it's it's quite clearly it's what people predominantly use an ECG to to look for. Uh, yes, Matt. I certainly will. Um, my plan is. Um, to um, put the Facebook events on a few weeks in advance and within the events it will say what's going to be covered. If that makes sense like we did for this one. But I'll try, I'll try and put them up a bit, a bit sooner. Uh, haven't decided yet, Andrew. Um, as we go through, a lot of them will, um, we will start to ask for things that people want covered. Um, as we, we will cover, we'll cover the basics that everybody needs to know. And then if there's anything anybody wants to go through in particular, we'll, we'll put a session on for that. So uh, it's an unknown at the moment.
Uh, yes, absolutely. Is that Jason? Yes, Jason. Um, we we've we've talked about this, so um, I, I think certainly we're going to go into um, bloods. So after after ECG, we're going to do a section on bloods, um, and then I think we'll we'll um, we'll probably carry on with with some other subjects. I I can't imagine we'll stop there. So absolutely. A lot of it does depend on time. We both work full time, so trying to trying to get this squeezed in around work is is sometimes challenging. But uh, yes, our plan is to carry on. <laughs> uh, what do we get? So, would you be able to do a session how to use? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've we've got uh, we've got a life pack twelve. I know it's a bit out of date, but it's fairly similar to the fifteen. We can. We could certainly do a how-to video on how to how to actually use a LifePack 15, or, or you know how to do an ECG. No problem. Uh, yes, definitely Wolf Parkinson White. It's um it's a very interesting subject. So yeah, that will come up. Uh, okay, lovely. Uh, so, uh, Natasha, um, okay. So, genetic and structural conditions from birth and how will they all affect an ECG later in life? I, I mean, absolutely, we can um, see that would be kind of development of the heart and, and things along those lines. Absolutely, we can, we can look into that. That's not a problem. I'll put that on the list. Uh, okay, anything on the causes of SVT? Absolutely, SVT um, will be a session in its own because there's lots of different types. So yeah, uh, and it will probably... Actually, I wonder, I wonder if that will be tagged on to Wolf Parkinson White, but yes, we will, um, we will do some SVT stuff with you. Um, scenario teaching? Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So are you medical school, PA school, paramedics? What type of level are we, are we aiming that at? Fabulous. Oh, welcome to the uh, the world of PAs. We have one sitting opposite at the moment. <laughs> Lovely. Um, okay. Uh, fab. Welcome. Lots of PAs around. It's, it's good to see. I uh, often loiter around Northwick Park, not through choice, but um, there are there are plenty of PAs up there. So it's good to see them getting around. So. Um, but yes, to answer the question, OSCE style scenario teaching, I think we could probably do something on a, on a cardiovascular exam. That would, I think we could do that. OSCE stop type style. Oh, fine. Oh, fine. Yeah, I, I get your drift. <laughs> That's fine. We can uh, we can do stuff around that. Uh, prolonged QT and genetic. Yes, it it, it well the, there are some genetic conditions behind it, um, and uh, obviously some structural and drug uh, related changes. So we we are going to talk about the T wave. Um, I haven't quite uh, nailed down the structure of that lecture yet. So keep an eye on our Facebook. Um, we we will cover long QT because it's. Um, it is, it is obviously relevant and it's something we need to be looking for 
um, on on our ACG. So it will get covered probably in the T the T wave lecture would make most sense. Yeah, PVCs and packs. We can um, we can certainly talk through. So again, that will a lot of that may come up next week. Actually, thinking about it, depending on how um, how much um, we end up putting together for it, so that may come up in lead twos. Um, um, I mean, we I've, I've got a, a session planned on atrial anomalies. So um, packs will come up in atrial anomalies because obviously you need a few different views to try and figure out. Um, where they're coming from. PVCs, we'll, we'll probably talk about next week. Um, so it goes. So uh, ECG, ECG leads. Um, again, it's uh, to be honest, it seems to come down to personal preference. Um, I've yet to see any persuasive evidence in either direction over using shoulders and hips versus wrists and ankles. Uh, when we were first taught, it was limb leads go on limbs, so it was fairly fairly straightforward. But since then, um, it, it is certainly true that you get a much clearer trace, particularly in the uh, in the limb leads, um, if you if you place them on the uh, shoulders and hips so that is so they predominantly do it because you, you get a clearer trace it's easier to monitor the patient particularly if a bit agitated etc uh, yes noisier traces on the limbs most definitely um, try and get an ECG off someone who's cold and shivering uh, by putting them on the limbs and you'll see what we mean um, you just fill of artifacts and the machine won't interpret it so um, shoulders and hips generally works for me Uh, any further questions before we um, before we sign off then? Okay, folks. So if there, if there are any questions, pop them across to webinars um, at STC. Let me just uh, I'll bring that up. So work. There we go. Any questions? Uh, webinars at stctrainingsolutions.co.uk if you think of anything in the meantime. Uh, everything will get uploaded over the course of this week. Um, uh, so you'll be able to watch it again and download any uh, any of the uh, bits that go with it. So um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we shall probably see you uh, hopefully next uh, Monday at 7 o'clock in that case. Take care, everyone.